Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to ProductCon Online. It's my great pleasure to be here to talk to all of you. I know many of you are joining from different parts of the world. Um, it's exciting to get uh, product managers from, from across the world together. Um, I hope I make this worth your time. Um, my name is Amit Fule, and let me start with uh, a little bit of my introduction. You know, over the last 15 years of being a product manager, I've worked at various companies. Um, I started my career straight out of Microsoft, uh, straight out of school at Microsoft. And then I joined a startup called Social Gold, um, which was doing monetization for casual games. This was the time when Farmville, believe it or not, was the most popular game on the web. Um, and then my startup, we built a platform that would help game developers monetize. Um, luckily enough, uh, the startup got acquired by Google and I spent eight years there working on various communications products. After that, I moved to Meta and I worked on the Facebook app and Newsfeed, which is the central uh, product um, that you see if you use Facebook. And in 2021, I moved to Microsoft. I'm currently at Microsoft and I work on a few of our communications products, Microsoft Teams, Skype, and GroupMe. So that's a little bit about me. And what I intend to talk about in the next 20 minutes is really a couple of things. First is how do you manage products, teams, and yourself? If you think about you know, the core components of your job as a product manager um, is to build products, is to do it uh, with a group of people, a group of experts, and more importantly, how do you manage yourself through that journey? So that's what I'm going to speak about. I have some thoughts on how to retool that for the age of AI with this big platform shift. What are the things to keep in mind um, as we all approach uh, this new uncharted territory? And all the insights that I'm going to share are based on my experience over the last 15 years. Um, I hope these insights are non-obvious ones. They're not the ones that you read about in a lot of product literature. And they help you think about some of the situations that you might find yourself in. Um, so with that, let's get started with the first section, which is around managing products. And I have three kind of insights to share here Starting with, you know, how do, how do you build product sense, right? This is the key question for all of us as product managers. It's a little elusive. The term can have many interpretations. Um, it's, it doesn't have a real clear definition, but it's the core part of your job, your ability to build crafted products that, you know, deliver value and get a lot of adoption and usage. That's kind of what we're all trying to do. And so, you know, let me start with a couple of metaphors that kind of help have helped me think about how to make sense of this ability that we call product sense. The first is cooks with its chefs. You know, cooks follow a recipe. If you've ever cooked something, I mean, um, I'm an amateur cook, but the the way we go about it is you look at ingredients, you look at the process. And a lot of times what we do in product is kind of follow a recipe, follow a framework, follow a product, follow a way of doing things. And there are chefs who are creative, who probably never rely on recipes and would pick a bunch of ingredients and try different things. And so if you think about your work and, and how you approach products, you know, this is a helpful metaphor to think about, you know, at what points in your project you're called upon to be a cook, to follow something versus uh, build something that new with a set of ingredients that you have. Um, the other I think of is doctors and nurses, right? Um, nurses are the ones who will triage a patient. They look at the vitals. Um, they look at how the patient is feeling, ask them questions. And that's what sometimes we have to do. We have to triage. We have to understand the situa situation. What is the customer saying? What is the data showing us? What parts of the product are trending well, being used well? And doctors, if, you, if you've if ever been to a doctor's office, 
will take some of those vitals but make a very quick diagnosis, right? They're relying on the, the years of experience that they have and the pattern, ma pattern matching that they can do to really prescribe something on, on how, to, how to get better. Here's the, here's the remedy that you need. And so again, think about product sense in, in, in kind of those two buckets, which is, you know, times when you have to triage and the times when you have to make a, a call, a gut call and, and pick a path and pick an approach, pick a diagnosis, so to speak. Now, I give these metaphors as a way to kind of wrap around your head what product sense is. It's not a judgment. It's not to say, you know, one skill is better than the other. Now, it's true that as you go through your career, you will build strength in some of these uh, aspects. You might be an innovator, you're more like a chef, you, you, you throw away the rules, but you look at what could serve the users well. And you might be at times working in a product that's established and really trying to grow it and diagnose it like a nurse. And so keep those kind of things in mind and try to build these faculties as a product manager, your ability to be a, a cook and a chef and have the intuition of a doctor that you own over the years is as important as being a nurse and diagnosing those. Okay, so that's a combination of these skills. Now, how do you build product sense? You know, I think there's, there's two things that I have found that, that, that are really important. Um, one is observing users. Um, you know, we talk about this a lot building empathy, but nothing builds better product sense than seeing people actually use your product. No matter what vertical you're in, no matter what type of product you're building, you have users, you have to watch them, you have to see where they struggle, what they find delightful, what their journey is. And not just for your product, the more you observe real people using different types of products, I think the better you'll start to build that sense of what works and what doesn't. I also, you know, if you go to Amazon um, and look at some of the product reviews that are highly rated, you know, you'd be amazed at how some people are able to uh, unpack a product, break apart a product, talk about their strengths, talk about how they use it in their daily lives, you know, talk about value versus price, things don't, that don't work well. And, you know, product reviewers do that, movie critics do that, they look at a movie, they, they are able to analyze it well. That's the kind of sense that is really helps you sharpen your product instincts. And so if you are, no matter what product you, you know, app, no new apps, any new apps that you install, any products that you encounter from your own company, from the other company, your ability to decipher, to analyze, the more you do it, the more practice you do, compare notes, write it down, the better you're going to be able to sharpen your product sense, right? So think like a movie critic, think about the different faculties that kind of comprise uh, the product sense and observe real users um, playing with products in the real world. The second insight, and again, as a product manager, one of the fascinating things in this discipline is there's just so much out there, it's a great thing. Lots of theory, lots of books, people blogging, podcasts. And turns out, you know, a lot of the theories um, are quite easy to learn. You know, the, how do you do growth? How do you do experimentation? These are key things, you know, how do you work with design? Um, build a product, a life cycle, the way to write specs. Now, why is it that when all of these concepts are available to everybody and are, are in some ways easy to grasp, not everyone is able to build great products? Because applying these theories is so hard. Now, the reason it is hard is because we live in a complex world. You build products in a complex world, in a complex org, maybe in teams. There are a lot more variables involved. When you look at some of these frameworks, you know, there's a clear cause and effect. Here's what you do. Step A will lead you to step B. And this is how you kind of grow your product. But when you apply it in real world, a lot more variables come in. And that's why that theory actually doesn't work the way you intended it to. Because 
you, you have to look at constraints, you have to look at market dynamics, things that go wrong, people, issues on the team, and applying it is very hard. And so the way to really build that judgment, it really comes down to the judgment. How do you take a, a set of concepts, a set of a way of doing things and apply it? The way to build that judgment is really to do this over and over again. And so if you are an early part of your career, you know, build a lot more than the, the content and the theories that you consume, make mistakes, reflect upon them, document them. And, and, and that's how you're going to repeatedly build that judgment, build that experience that's going to let you apply some of the learnings a lot better. Okay, so no substitute to just building stuff. And that's the way to become a good PM. You know, let me talk about strategy for a little bit. I don't think there's any term that's more used and often misunderstood than strategy, right? A lot of us equate strategy with a big, bold vision, a new direction, taking your team or your company or your product in new areas. Whereas it comes out, good strategy, and, and I highly recommend the book if you haven't, Good versus Bad Strategy, is really about what is the challenge you're facing uh, and how you're going to address it and what are the unique advantages you bring to address it, right? That's really the formulation of a strategy. And the more, the closer you are to details, the better informed you're going to, your strategy is going to be. And so one of the things that, you know, misconceptions that I want all of us to get over is, um, you know, there's some kind of a, a ladder here where you start your career and managing the details and doing features. And as you go up in your career, you just do strategic work. In fact, the um, opposite is really true for effective strategy to build an effective strategy, no matter what it is, it could be for your small feature, it could be for your uh, for your product, it could be for your company, the closer you are to details in understanding what the challenge is, the much better equipped you are to be able to address that. And that's really what a good strategy is. So three insights I want to share, how to go about building a product sense, why application is, is a lot more important than theory, and how to think about strategy that comes from details. Let me switch gears here to talk about how to manage teams. And, you know, this is not about management. This is not about you being the lead or a manager and how to manage your reports. But this is about, in the act of building product, you never do it alone. We work, you work with designers and engineers, other cross-functional partners. And this, these insights are about how do you get a group of people to do things in a way that the sum of its part is greater than the whole, right? And so a few insights, and I'll only start by talking about decision-making. Now, no matter how well articulated your strategy is, the rubber really needs to roll when in the day-to-day, -day, you and your team start building and start making decisions. You know, if you think about it, a product is nothing but a, some of all the decisions that various people who work working on it make every day. You know, it's it's what feature you trade off, it's what compromise you make when you're presented with a challenge between, you know, date and quality. It's how you design something, you know, what options you show the user out of the many you might have explored. All of these small decisions actually add up to make the product what it is in front of the users. And so if you want to be really good at product building, you really have to think about how your team, how a group of people make decisions. And there are various aspects about it. And, and some of the key principles that you should try to adhere to are around having utmost transparency. Because if one part of the product unit is making a decision that can impact the other. It's really important how they arrived at that decision. It's documented, people can look at it. 
there's a way to both challenge and accept it and how are decisions that are what parts what parts are directives that come from the top versus the details and the data that the team working on something is supposed to right so now i'm not going to lay out a, a particular framework here because based on your environment based on your company culture you have various decision making processes but i want you to be super aware that this is really what will define both your company the culture and the product the way you make decisions the way they get communicated the way they can be challenged versus not is the way that product will start to shape together the second aspect when it comes to teams coming together to build something is really about velocity and i know you know speed and velocity well i like the term velocity better because it's directional but every time we talk about this it really comes down to how quickly you get things into the market and a lot of focus then tends to be around how quickly can something be developed how quickly can you test it get data back make decisions that's really what we think about velocity but i wanted to you know give you another another mental model here to think about velocity i want you to imagine a classic funnel okay and and let's think about this funnel as your entire product building process at the top of the funnel is all the ideas all the the strategy the themes the vision the discussion about what needs to be built and how and at the bottom of the funnel is really the code that comes out and and you know the product that gets in the hands of the users and everything that happens in the middle from everything from an idea from inception to launch is really that funnel that you have and as product managers if you want to speed up that system you have a lot more control over the top part of the funnel you know about how to get from go from ideas to something concrete that can be worked on that part of the funnel really is driven by a lot of product managers and so if you're focusing on velocity own that part of the funnel how quickly you arrive at decisions how do you involve stakeholders how do you vet out ideas how do you get input before you start coding these things are in your control and if you want to speed up um you got to make sure you remove friction from that process from that part of the funnel excellence is a habit um you know the you know what i've learned over the years is successful teams are the ones who never forget the basics you know doing the small things really really well because if you if you tolerate a culture in which sloppy work is okay a missed deadline somebody who was supposed to follow up on things did not um an analysis that could have been a little bit more rigorous these small cuts that you are you become okay with they add up they add up and then the work starts to kind of dilute or even before it um reaches the users and so you know make sure you are not only setting the pace for your team and setting the direction but you're also holding that bar establish and holding that bar for every member of the team on what the expectations around the work are because you know excellence is very contagious and when you see people doing great work others want to emulate others want to do their best as well and in great teams that's the one ingredient that i've seen one of the one of the early career lessons that i learned um was really focusing on what is right as opposed to who is right and you know it manifests itself in many many ways you you, you will be in decision making forums where there's somebody who's way more senior um in the room and you will be in forums where somebody is just starting out on their career journey and 
building that ability to not think about who is saying a given point of view, but what they are saying and, and focusing on that will help you make better decisions. Not worrying about if this is coming from a senior person, so I should accept it. Not dismissing something that's maybe coming from a fresh insight, a fresh college term. And if all times you are in the pursuit of that objective truth when you're building products, because decisions will come, trade-offs will come. And the more you focus on what is being discussed as opposed to who brought it, who, who, who is behind it, the better and uh, decisions and the better product judgment you build, right? So always focus on what is right, not who is right. One of the um, quotes from Ed Catmo, the CEO of Pixar, that has stuck with me has been, you know, you have a problem as if there is more truth in the hallways than in the meetings. And what it really means is if that is happening, then the culture of your team is not very healthy because people are afraid to discuss problems in the right forums. And they know the truth about what's not working, but they're not able to bring it in the right places. And so in order to build successful products, you have to create, you know, what, what, I, what I call as collision-rich safe spaces. And there are many ways to think about it. You know, if you, if you read it, uh, uh, some of the teachings from Shreya, he talks about doing pre-mortems, you know, getting a group of folks together before you're launching something to figure out what could go wrong. Uh, there's a habit of doing retrospectives. Um, there's after action reviews, you know, that, that's a method that the Navy SEAL came with. But I am not, I'm not, um, uh, picking a particular mechanic. I mean, you can build any of these in your product development. But what is really important is to understand is that you need to have forums where people can bring the bad news um, without fear of judgment. That you have these spaces where the truth travels fast, the day, even if it's not something you like, um, is something that can be discussed, can be acted upon. Great teams that build great products uh, have a level of candor that helps them isolate issues way in advance. Okay, so create these collision rich safe spaces. And then the final insight that I'll um, share with you around managing teams is, I mean, well, it took me a, a long time um, to really embrace this, this notion of polarity. And the notion of polarity says, you know, sometimes there are two opposing sides of a problem, of an issue, with a healthy tension in between. And you have to embrace and find a middle path in order to proceed. Because my instinct always was to solve a problem. Let me give you some examples. You know, uh, um, a normal and a common polarity you will face is when you have to make trade-offs between quality of the product and the speed. It's, it's a polarity because it's in, inherently diametrically opposed. You know, if you want to move really fast, you might not have all the quality checks. If you want the perfect quality, perfect state of the product, it might slow you down, right? You cannot solve for this. The solving for this would pick one uh, at the expense of the other, and that might not be the, the right way. So you have to manage this polarity. You have to set some principles, some criteria in which how you would maybe compromise between the two or optimize for one versus the other given the situation. Another polarity is really um, you want a culture that is psychologically safe for folks to be able to um, say anything, bring up issues, critique, um, but also be able to receive them. Right, so if you if you want a culture with a lot of candor, but safe, sometimes those those might be at odds with each other. You know, one of the recent polarities I've, I've noticed is, you know, people want the flexibility of working remotely. You know, the convenience, uh, the efficiency of remote work, but they also create the connection with their colleagues, with their teammates. It's a polarity. You know, you cannot choose one versus the other. You have to really marry the two, 
And so, you know, this, this notion of polarity is helpful in situations if you detect them and are aware of them, then you are much less likely to make mistakes by choosing sides, but to really take both points of view and being deliberate about how you solve these varieties. Okay, so that's some of the kind of insights um, around managing your teams. Now, the last part is really how do you manage yourself? And, you know, when I started my career, my, my goal was to how quickly do I become a manager of others? Okay, how quickly do I become lead? I'm sure all of you in your either right now or in early parts of your career have had similar aspirations. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what I realized over the years was managing myself was actually far more impactful, far more critical than managing others. Because if I did a good job of managing my energy, my emotions, my time, I was a much better product leader than if I focused outwards on how to manage other people and get them to do certain things. So very critical part. Now, there's a lot of insight here I can share, but I've picked these three because this keeps coming up. As I talk to a lot of PMs across the, across the industry, you know, one of the first questions I get is really about how to get promoted. And it's a great question. I mean, I, I love, I love the push everybody has um, on, on progressing, on growth. Now, promotion is the way. There's other ways you can measure your growth, but let's just talk about promotions because it comes up so often. Now, you know, one insight, one thing I learned um, is really understanding what's holding you back. If you're stuck, if you want to get to the next level, whatever stage that might be, um, and I've been there too. You know, I've been there, I've been stuck. And stuck is actually a misnomer. I thought I was doing extremely well, but I still wasn't getting ahead. And this insight is really important to understand about what is it, what are additive and multiplicative systems, okay? Additive systems are the ones where you can add stuff and it has incremental impact, you know, just like you're adding numbers. And there are certain systems that are multiplicative, which is you can have a multiplying factor that has an exponential, it's an outsized impact. So if you are stuck and if you want to get promoted, think about if you are operating your career, your journey in an additive way. And what I mean by that is you're good at a certain set of things and you're doing more of those, right? You excel, let's say, at shipping certain features at, at, at certain quality and pace. And you've done that repeatedly and you're really good at it, but you're not getting promoted. And you might feel at that point, you're doing everything that you can, but you're still stuck. Turns out if you change your mental model to really understand what multiplicative systems are, usually to go from one ladder level to the other, you know, whatever system you follow in your company, there is an X factor, there is a multiplying factor. For example, maybe you are the best IC that there can be, but in order to get to the managerial level, you need to display certain abilities. That's your X factor. That is what you really have to both understand and exhibit in order to get to the next level, right? You might be the best at building products, but that X factor to make, to get you to director is your ability to work with other parts of your team, other organizations within your company. And if you're not doing that, no matter how good you are at a certain level, you'll stay there. So at any given point, always try to understand what is it that has a multiplying effect and to get you to the next level. Okay, so that's one insight I had around thinking about promotions. The next critical thing is really about increasing your bandwidth. And as you go along in your career, um, the demands on your time and on your energy are going to keep increasing. Um, and your ability to handle increased pressure, increased um, uh, demand for your attention, for understanding concepts, for going through stuff, that is a skill that is probably the most important as you think about your career journey. 
the there are many frameworks here to think about time management one of the ones that i like to think about is it's pretty simple which is you know i divide my time into what i drive versus what i get called upon okay my time versus others time and my time is every time i have to do i have to write i have to do deep thinking deep learning that's my time and others time is when i get pulled into meetings into decisions into updates into fire drills now you in order to manage your time better you need to really first start with understanding what your split is between what your my time and you know time that is demanded by others and then really figure out what is the optimal state for you and how do you reallocate that time and how do you prioritize and how do you remove things from your calendar to be able to better adjust that because the more me time you have which is issues and topics and product aspect that you need to work on and more control you have over that the better you are going to be uh, able to make impact so always think about are you doing things more efficiently and are you doing fewer things as you go through your career the final thing i say about managing yourself is really around mindset and you know careers are long um uh, we all as humans are healthier um we're going to live longer which means we're going to work longer and how you approach this long journey is actually really really important more so than the destination that you might have in mind so i have a few uh learnings here over the years which is first you know careers are like like full of ups and downs right if they don't follow a linear path and no matter how chronological everybody's resume looks like and linkedin profile looks like your ability to ride the waves stay persistent work hard even when the chip, even the things are down are not going your way as well as really capitalize on the highs and the opportunities is going to determine so embrace that up and down and don't assume things are going to be linear you know catapult is a concept i think about in career management a lot which really is how do you take a step back sometimes in order to move forward with greater momentum that's the catapult action and this might mean a smaller role a smaller company less comp but in all cases you're optimizing for learnings because you know that those set of learnings and that experience is actually going to propel you in the days and your weeks and years ahead so think about catapult don't ignore those opportunities because i think they can have an outsized impact um you know if you find people that are sponsors to you that believe in your abilities more than you thought you could do work with those kind of people you know it's not always easy to come by but that'll be the uh, i would say the biggest unlock in your career and then the final thing on careers is look as you go through this journey your goals are always going to change you know and that's okay and you know sometimes you you'll optimize for money and and title which is totally fine sometimes you optimize for the product and the kind of people you work with and you you start to optimize for like you know what what you are as you as you are in like latter stage of your career is like what what your legacy is what do you give back what do you leave this world with and you know this progression and this ever changing nature of your career aspiration is a natural thing as as you gain more experience and maturity but always be aware of what you're optimizing for okay and so that's uh, some of the insights i've learned over the years on on managing managing yourself now in this final section i really wanted to talk about uh this this new platform shift there and, and how do you redo some of these concepts um as we get into the ai era So there's a few things I want to touch upon here, right? One first, let's let's one of the most important questions I get is like, how much of what we're seeing today is hype versus reality? Okay, and I don't know the answer. You know, I think it's a little bit of a mix of both. Uh, there's obviously huge potential, but when there's huge potential, there's a lot, lot more uh, stuff going on in in, in the space. 
you know, it's it's worthwhile to look back at the dot com um, bubble, which was in like 2000, 2001. I don't know, some of you might not have, might not recall or were not there. But what happened in the dot com bubble was very similar to um, what hype and, and bus cycles go through, which is there was a lot of build, internet was the new big thing, everybody was trying to move online. And a lot of these companies actually uh, did not survive. That was the crash. Everything from selling pet food, you know, everything wanted to go online. But if you actually look back and think about all the concepts that might have crashed in 2000, 2001 in that bubble, they all came to fruition many years later. All the ideas that people were chasing actually came, came true. And so there was a lot of build-out that happened at that time. And not everything succeeded, but over time it did. And so one way I think about these, these cycles is, you know, what are the concepts that might not come to fruition today, but over time they, they will. And so it's always interesting to be in these um, new shifts. Now, as you're building pro products here, number two, in the age of AI, um, you know, I think it's really helpful to assume exponential progress at an exponential rate. And we're already seeing that, but that's just going to accelerate. Because it has real implication on how you think about building your product, right? If you take what exists today and all the constraints you have and build only towards that, then you might miss out on a great opportunity down the road. And if you look at what's happening, you know, the cost of inference is going down, it will continue to go down. We have many um, models now, frontier models, smaller models that can operate on the edge versus only in the cloud, multimodal models. And, and these things are just going to become all pervasive, right? Better data is going to result in better reasoning. And so the more, the, the more you think about the quality of data that you can apply, the better your product is going to be, right? And all the tools that are being built for, you know, building AI products for operations, for development, those are getting better and faster too. So one, one important thing to keep in mind is assume where we're going to be two years from now, three years from now, five years. Now you can't predict where you're going to be, but you know that a lot of these things that are constraints today are probably going to diminish over time. And so think about how you build a product in that um, for that point in time. Point three is really about rethinking uh, some of the concepts. Look, I think we have many solved, what might seem as solved problems in every vertical, whether it's healthcare, whether it's travel, um, creation, but AI and the advances that we have recently give us the opportunity to rethink, to reimagine those solutions themselves, okay? I always take the example of travel. I mean, for many years now, we all, it's ingrained in us to go to travel websites, you know, punch in your dates and, and budget and find locations. But the act of travel planning, if you reimagine and you apply some of the advances with LLM, could be vastly different, you know. You could have agents, AI agents, that actually know everything about you. What kind of places you like when you travel, where have you traveled so far, your budget, your budget for next year, and really give you those recommendations and plan it for you, right? We're not far from these kind of scenarios. And I give you that example in, a, in, in order to help you kind of take some of what you think of solved or this part of the um, product solution exists and reimagine it and reapply some of these things to, to think about how you can build something better. You know, for all this fascination with the infrastructure and uh, the base foundational layer, the real innovation is really not gonna, uh, cannot happen if you don't build those experiences in the application layer. 
I think it's an obvious thing, but you know, the example that always I, I point folks to is the way the power of smartphones uh, really was exploited by mobile native applications when they were built with that capability in mind. You know, camera, now everybody had a camera when smartphones came about. What implications does that have for video creation, for, for photo creation, for how much photo, for media that you have on your phones that needs to be backed up? GPS was another example, right? It was not just turn by turn directions, but entirely native apps like Uber that exploited the, the, that capability um, and, and really built a new way of doing things for us. And so for AI, we have to think about similar lines, which is what are the AI native applications that, that are not just repainting what we have today, but are exploiting the capabilities, that leveraging the capabilities uh, in a way that results in new user behavior, results in new ways of doing things. The final point I'll make is, look, we it's a fresh start for all of us. And what I mean by that is whatever worked so far might not work going forward. Things we've learned, the way of doing things, the tools we've used, everything is going to go through a radical change. And adopting a beginner's mindset, it's for all of us, you know, each one of you listening, <laughs> I'm talking, but, you know, I'm learning every day. And, you know, going back to the drawing board, so to speak, it's like, how do you keep abreast with the new technologies, new capabilities? Uh, how do you learn new ways of building those and applying those and failing? I think that's really um, the call of this time, you know. And I really want to encourage you to start doing that now, both for yourself and for your team. Don't punt this, don't delay learning about AI or, or building some of these things because you're not sure how it applies to your current work and current product. Um, because if you don't, then someone else will, okay? Now, finally, you know, I want to leave you with one of the wish I have for the future, for not just for um, all of you, myself, everybody I interact with. And as product managers, we spend so much time in building product sense and building our products. All of you work in companies and roles that have huge impact. You know, whether it's a small company, small startup, a big scale company, what you do every day, the decisions you make, the problems you pick to solve versus not, have huge implications, right? And we really have to also build a deep moral sense in how we go about solving those problems. And, you know, if I look at what are the top problems in the world today, they are around access to drinking water and loneliness as an epidemic. Um, climate, there are many things that confront us, confront larger humanity. And as we um, build products, build the future, learn about AI, learn about the future, I just hope we keep those things in mind, where the problems we choose to work on and the way we approach them, you know, bring the utmost value to, to humanity and to this planet. And so, you know, I don't want to sound too preachy or anything, but it's really one of those things it's, it, that I always think about when I think about the future of product management of building products is, what is that future going to look like when intelligence is abundant, software can be built rapidly and maybe automatically, where would our role be? And it would be in really directing that to problems that benefit the most of us. That's all I had uh, today. Thank you for joining me. Um, if you like any of these insights, uh, shoot me a note. If you have questions, if you have your own that you would like to share, I would love to hear them. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. 
And I hope you have a great rest of uh, uh, product school presentations and day and good day of learning. Thank you.